Well, happy Wednesday, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Nelson. I'm the Communications Director at the University of Utah, and I want to welcome everyone to the first in a series of town hall meetings as we communicate current and future plans and are thinking around these plans as we get ready for fall semester at the University of Utah. As has been previously announced, uh, the university expects to have the majority of its classes to be held in person this fall uh, with active student activities and a full fall break. Uh, today, we're joined by a, a, a it's a fairly large cast uh, of experts from the university's administration, and I'll introduce them as we go through. Um, but I do want to ref reference everyone back to our At The U uh, website, as well as our coronavirus.utah.edu website for more information as well. One point as we talk about today, there are going to be a lot of questions that we're going to ask. We have a lot of great submissions from folks that we just don't have answers for yet. And so part of our goal today is to uh, make sure the campus community is aware of what the thought process around this is. And so I think what we'll, the, the plan is we'll go through all the speakers here at first, and then we'll get back to questions. So with that, I'll turn over the time to President Ruth Watkins uh, for her remarks. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much, Chris. We appreciate you being with us. I want to say a big message of thank you. Uh, my job is to express gratitude for what you have done to get us through this pandemic year and to help us think forward for a healthy future. Here we are, one month to the finish line of this semester. You have all made that possible with your hard work, with your creativity, with your innovation. You have done remarkable things keeping our campus safe, operational, and successful. Thank you for what you've done. As we look to the future, we know that the University of Utah is on a wonderful upward trajectory, and I fully anticipate that will continue. Part of our work together will be thinking about how we continue to navigate safely through commencement, through the summer, and into a fall semester where we anticipate we will be back in person much more. We also have the opportunity to learn from this experience and build back better. I know you will have questions about how we anticipate doing that, what might remain as remote work, how we might learn through this about our digital learning opportunities. I am eager for those dialogues and those questions. They are precisely the ones for us to ask. So thank you for being with us. And I'm going to pass back to Chris uh, for our next speaker. Thanks, President. Our next speaker is Dr. Mike Good. Dr. Good is the Senior Vice President for Health Sciences and soon to be Interim President of the University of Utah. Dr. Good. I add my thanks to our entire campus community uh, working together. Uh, we've kept this virus, this pandemic, at a particularly low level uh, on our campus, uh, all doing the things uh, that we need to do. The vaccination program in the state of Utah kind of all hands on deck. Our state has done a good job acquiring vaccine and through the county health departments and more recently through the health systems, including University of Utah Health, we are now vaccinating all adults. In fact, all those 16 years of age and older are eligible uh, for a vaccine and are strongly encouraged uh, to get it. A number of our U Health clinics uh, are offering a vaccination. And that, so that's first and foremost, uh, please uh, get a vaccine uh, as, uh, as you are eligible uh, now. Second thing is we are really seeing the effects of uh, vaccination and also continued good public health measures. We're in a, we're in a good place in the state of Utah at this moment uh, with low levels of virus. However, after several weeks of decline, we kind of have leveled off. We're not seeing those declines anymore. And so we, we need to remain very vigilant and continue doing uh, things like masking and like uh, distancing and so on till we can get everyone vaccinated. Over 80% of those 70 and older in our state have been vaccinated. And we're up over 60% of those 60 and older have been vaccinated. As we work into each of the, the decades, obviously there's more and more people to vaccinate, uh, but right now we're in a, in a good place. We've seen the, at one time we had 90 patients in University Hospital. We got down actually a little bit under 10, uh, but that's eased back up. Today we have 20 uh, COVID patients in our, in our hospital. Um, as I said, while the state of Utah and particularly the campus of the University of Utah is in a good place. That is not true throughout the world and particularly in some other states 
uh, across uh, the United States of America. And so we're going to have to remain vigilant and uh, again, just push real hard to get everyone vaccinated uh, as we anticipate uh, where we'll be in the fall. That's a really important uh, part of the equation. Chris, back to you. Thank you, Dr. Good. Uh, next up is uh, Dr. Dan Reed, who's the Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs. Dr. Reed. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I want to uh, join in echoing what President Watkins and, uh, and SVP Good said. A huge, huge thank you. I think one of the things that's really been a hallmark of the One Utah model is how everyone has pitched in and collaborated across so many axes as we've navigated um, complex and, and in many cases rapidly shifting circumstances. It's been a partnership and a collaboration and a, a willingness to work together that has helped us uh, avoid some of the challenges that some of our peer institutions have experienced. So just a, a big thank you. I want to echo what Mike said about uh, continuing to remain vigilant uh, in terms of face coverings uh, and social distancing and uh, personal hand hygiene. All of those things are important as we're in this transition space. Uh, I'm reminded of the old Wayne Gretzky comment about skating to where the puck will be not where it is. And that's what we're really, as we look to the fall, are trying to do. We're trying to look at what we think is the most likely uh, um, eventualities that will hold in terms of uh, vaccination distribution, um, of, um, of COVID uh, prevalence uh, in Utah and planning for that. But I want to reassure everyone that we have contingency plans uh, and it should things um, uh, turn um, back to another spike at that time, we will uh, absolutely return to online instruction. So uh, we know how to do that. Uh, thanks to all of you. We work through all of those trade-offs. Uh, we have good plans for that. We know how to do it. Uh, and we will uh, keep those plans active should it be necessary. But what we're planning for the fall, based on, as I said, uh, trying to skate to where the puck will be, uh, is a belief that uh, everyone who wants to be vaccinated 16 and above will have had the opportunity uh, before fall classes start. That's, that's our planning operation mode right now. And so we've been working with our counterparts across the state, and I've been in regular contact with my PAC-12 peers as we talk about what's common and, as, as Mike said, what's different in different states. Uh, the guidance that we receive from uh, UCI, the UC System of Higher Education, our uh, governing board for the state, uh, is that we should look at, when we think about in-person classes, uh, look at sections, uh, and so, uh, I really want to express my thanks for the partnership with all of the college level and departmental schedulers, uh, department heads and deans who worked collaboratively with the registrar's office to plan for the fall. Uh, right now, we are just at about in terms of planning for the schedule that we released uh, on Monday. Uh, about 85% of our classes will have some portion of an in-person component. That includes um, some traditional lectures, but it includes interactive video classes that may have an in-person component. It includes hybrid classes. So it's a broad definition of in-person, not just the traditional lecture format. Uh, and so a huge thank you to people for working on that. As I said, we have contingency plans. Should we need to pivot back to more online, we will do so. As always, and I said this throughout this entire process, our number one priority is and will remain the health of our faculty, staff, and students. Nothing is more important than that. And that will continue to guide what we do, but shaped by evolving public health guidance as we look toward where we think we will be uh, in August. Um, and as Chris mentioned at the outset, we do plan to have a traditional fall break. Uh, and so you can mark that on your calendar. Uh, it's going to happen. Um, that's, that's our plan of record at the moment with the, uh, the fall schedule. Um, I do want to comment on a question someone asked about the mix of in-person and online. And I do want to remind people that 
prior to COVID-19, the U was aggressively moving down a path to offering more online course offerings. That work continues, uh, and that's intended to support flexibility for our students who may have part-time jobs or other life conflicts. So on the one hand, we're planning for more online classes, but we're also aggressively planning for more uh, online classes to go with the in-person classes. Uh, and if you look at the fall, um, I think one of the things you're going to hear, and this is my really my last key point, for all of us in the spirit of the old adage of never waste a crisis, what can we all learn from the COVID-19 experience that will allow us in a one U perspective, uh, to use the phrase that President Watkins uh, used, build back better? How can we be better post-COVID than we were pre-COVID? And that means thinking about what things we might learn about telework, what we might learn about online instruction, about flexibility. How do we capitalize on all of those things? But my message to you is we are expecting to be back based on what we think will be true, uh, largely back on campus, but public health will guide everything that we do as we think about health and safety of our faculty, staff, and students, uh, not only physical health, but mental health and well-being as well, because those go hand in hand. So back to you, Chris. Thanks, Dr. Reed. Uh, this next section, we'll, we'll kind of get into some of the specifics. We'll get in the weeds a little bit. And next speaker is Dr. Richard Orlandi. Dr. Orlandi is a clinician at University of Utah Health and the Associate Chief Medical Officer for Ambulatory Health. Dr. Orlandi. Thanks, Chris. Um, as Dr. Good mentioned, vaccination is going to be a very important part of getting back to normal. Uh, or whatever that new normal is in the fall. Um, the state of Utah has chosen to distribute vaccine largely through local health departments and is frankly doing a very good job of getting the vaccine that we receive from the federal government into arms very quickly. We're one of the top states in that, in that metric. And so we will continue to rely on our local health departments for the vast majority of vaccinations. Now, University of Utah Health, as well as other health uh, organizations in the state, are receiving a small percentage to augment that effort, to support the state's effort in an, in a support, in an accessory or supporting role. And that will be true um, as we go into the, into the late spring. And uh, University of Utah Health will continue to vaccinate our, uh, our patients, our, especially our at-risk, and and any patients that require it who are unable to get access to the uh, resources, vaccination resources in their local health departments, and that will include our campus community. We anticipate that those who wish to be vaccinated within the state of Utah will largely be vaccinated by early summer, probably late May, June uh, time period, um, as we look down the, down the road at vaccine availability. That will allow us to be uh, in a position to then convert to a more normal, if there is such a thing with COVID, normal vaccination process as we do with flu or other things as we get into the fall semester for those, again, who wish to be vaccinated. That's how we're looking at things now, and I certainly look forward to answering any questions uh, as they come up. Chris? Thanks, Dr. Orlandi. Uh, Dr. Stephen Lacey is the Chief of the Division of Public Health at the University's Medical School. Uh, Dr. Lacey, and, and also I should mention, has become a Senior Advisor to the Administration uh, and the Cabinet on during during the, the, the COVID crisis. So, Dr. Lacey. Hey, thank you, Chris. Thank you uh, for having me, and good afternoon, everyone. I, I want to lead with a thank you to our incident management team. Uh, this is a, a group of faculty and staff members that have been lending their expertise to uh, work with our campus emergency management team to put policy into practice uh, to keep our campus safe. Uh, at any given point in time over the past year, there must be one or 200 people working on this problem uh, to keep COVID off campus best we can. And I'm really grateful uh, for that work. As Dr. Good um, hinted at a moment ago, the, the country's in a really vulnerable spot right now. Vaccines on the way but rollout takes time and the virus continues to circulate and variants are going to continue to emerge, right? So the most important thing that each of us can do right now is get vaccinated as soon as you're eligible. As soon as you're eligible, you have to, you have to get vaccinated. 
but while we work towards that that position of herd immunity, as they call it, as a nation, uh, we need to continue the basics. We need to keep masking and physical distancing and keep participating in our asymptomatic testing that Richard Orlandi and Andy Wyrick have, have stood up for the campus. Asymptomatic testing, I know, I know it feels like the pandemic is, is over, but it's not. Asymptomatic testing, especially for those that are on or coming to campus, lets us identify those that test positive so we can ask them to stay home. Identifying those positive cases allows us to put contact tracing into motion that further curbs additional transmission. So my points are um, get vaccinated as soon as you can. I get my second dose tomorrow. Continue to mask and physically distance. Continue to get tested, especially if you're on or coming to campus. If you test positive, use the self-reporting process to let us know that that closes that time window for us to get contact tracing into motion even more rapidly. All of, uh, all of this on how to do this, on, on where to get tested uh, and how to self-report, that's on coronavirus.utah.edu. And the last thing I'll say is answer your phone. Um, this is how you support contact tracing, by answering your phone. Doing all of these things are gonna help us accelerate out of the pandemic over these next few months. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Dr. Lacey. Uh, next speaker is the university's Vice President for Student Affairs, Dr. Lori McDonald. Thank you so much. I think in terms of when we think about on-campus housing, student activities on campus, and student services for the fall, you will hear very similar thoughts as to our planning for classes and everything that everyone has, has said before me. We have learned a lot about this virus, we have learned a lot about how to minimize risk as much as possible. And it has been um, an exercise in adaptation daily, and that will continue. But I think we know that it is really important, particularly for our students, but also our, our faculty and staff to have supportive and, and social opportunities, but supportive relationships to be successful in the classroom and out of the classroom. And so we are planning for how we can do that as safely as possible. I think you'll see um, a mix, just like Dr. Reed was explaining with classes, there we will continue to offer some virtual opportunities for connections. Um, they may be more physically distanced, but still socially connected. We will see some more, many more in-person opportunities for people to connect with public health guidelines like spacing out. We might be able, we're going to use more of our spaces on campus than we have been able to in the last year, but still encouraging that spreading out, masking, increased hygiene. And as Dr. Lacey mentioned, this is really when contact tracing will come into play, testing. Um, there will be lots more check-ins um, so that we know who is at events and how we can get in touch with them more quickly. I think um, we will still provide opportunities or lots of space for quarantine and isolation, particularly for those students who are living on campus and support resources for when individuals are in those situations. But uh, we just want to acknowledge that um, we are constantly adjusting and that is will remain challenging. Um, but with cautious optimism, I think we will see many more opportunities for interaction on campus. And we will also need to learn how to respectfully acknowledge individuals' personal boundaries and learn how to communicate that with one another. And so um, we can do this as a community. Um, and I, I also echo everyone's uh, gratitude for everyone who has been adaptable and contributing to how we can um, get through this together. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. McDonald. Uh, a significant part of the university's response to the pandemic has been the university's research enterprise and you know, the research labs have continued on following our protocols. Uh, and so we want to give a, a moment for our vice president for research, Dr. Andy Weirich, to speak and speak to that community and issues uh, unique to the research community. Dr. Weirich. Thanks, Chris, and thanks to all of you. And I do want a, a big shout out because I will say during COVID, research has continued to do really, really well during the three months of the last fiscal year and nine months into this fiscal year, 
we are way up on awards. We are continue to be way up on expenditures, um, publications, other activities that we're seeing are significantly increased. And that's just an amazing thing. And it's a testament to all of you. In parallel though, we are also way down or we haven't had any safety issues. So in the research community, that's one of the things that's been fantastic. Um, and across the university for that matter, um, we haven't had um, COVID where we've had cross-contamination between laboratories. And so we haven't had to shut anything down and it's been fantastic. So thanks to all of you for continuing to do fantastic on the research side, all of your hard work and doing it in a safe manner. Um, we are pretty much status quo for where we've been in May 11th. Um, PPE, as you know, will be continue to be required as always in our laboratories. Um, physical distancing will continue to be maintained under the guidelines that we have now and then following CDC closely. One of the big things for all of you is testing. Um, the surveillance testing is up and you will notice the tubes are just a little bit bigger now. Um, why is that? Because we can actually, if in positive cases, now go test for variants. So that's really important. So we are moving on that. We expect that to continue um, through the summer and into the fall. Um, and the, the one thing that people keep asking us about is undergraduate students. Undergraduate students in the summer um, will basically be allowed to come into the laboratories under the measures that we've taken in the past. Um, we are still working on some of the SPUR programs. So um, University of Utah students that are enrolled in that will be as is. We're looking to see whether we'll be able to accommodate some um, uh, undergraduates from other places like we typically have in small numbers. So we'll be looking at that closely. But really the take home is, is to continue to do what you're doing. Um, we will keep you posted as always, but the uh, big thing is to thank you for keeping research going at such a high trajectory and keeping us safe along the way. Thanks, Dr. Weirich. Uh, the university's human resources team has been particularly busy during the pandemic, and I think they're about to get busier as we plan for a return to, to fall uh, semester. And with some more on that is uh, Jeff Herring. Jeff is the university's chief human resources officer. Jeff. Thanks, Chris. And just want to echo the efforts that everybody has made uh, through this last year. Uh, it's, it's a big ship that we're, that we're uh, navigating here with the students and faculty and staff. We're hard at work uh, looking, I think, to combine some things that uh, Dr. Reed said and Dr. Orlandi had mentioned about skating to where the puck is uh, with Wayne Gretzky and, and this, this cautious optimism of vaccinations. But what we know is come fall uh, that we cannot uh, just flip a switch and have the campus community with faculty and staff uh, just return. So, we are, are looking and making efforts to start a gradual uh, process and planning process of, of making sure that we have time to phase that back in. It didn't uh, happen, well, it kind of happened overnight, but it was a while to, to, to leave campus. And so it's gonna be as much of an effort to come back to campus with that. We're coalescing around three different phases. The first phase that we're in right now really is planning. Um, the efforts of what that looks like, uh, what we anticipate that it's going to be, uh, looking at the data and the numbers uh, as, as they continue to improve. And based upon some of the medical uh, guidelines, I think you talked about, uh, Dr. Orlandi mentioned end of May, beginning of July, hope, or beginning of June, hopefully vaccinations for people want to be there, uh, get that will be able to be done. So we're starting to look around a July uh, uh, first process or around that beginning of July to start integrating people back into the campus so they can take care of the things that they need to so that when uh, the the fall semester six seven weeks later starts we've got the support in place for the students and the research and all of the health activities that are taking place on campus that we need to be here doing so I want to underline all of that with uh, the, what's been mentioned that we know how to shut down rather quickly. And if the things don't work out uh, uh, with the public health that uh, we anticipate that they will, then we will take contingency plans on that. But we, we have to uh, make the efforts now to plan for what we anticipate will be so that we've got all those areas covered for our students and uh, when they return to campus. So back to you, Chris. 
Thanks, Jeff. Um, all right, now we're going to enter the speed round. Uh, we'll, a, lot, a lot of very practical questions that have come in, and uh, I, I think most of you have seen these questions, but there may be a few, uh, and I'll try to direct them as best I can. Before we do that, I do want to thank Sean Wood and Brooke Adams with University Marketing Communications for making today's town hall possible and working behind the scenes. All right, so the first one, uh, first question uh, for Dr. Orlandi, Dr. Lacey, probably. Uh, how long will the university continue its testing program? Asymptomatic testing program, I should clarify. I'll take I'll take the uh, the lowbrow approach and then I'll, I'll defer to Dr. Lacey for the smart approach. I think that basically as long as necessary. I don't know that we know what's going to what what's going to happen with COVID. We've just learned not to plan too far in advance, and so um, I think that the asymptomatic testing helps us to understand what is going on in our campus community. It helps us to understand the risks to our campus community if, if rates are going up or down. It helps us to assess that risk. So. Other, I, I hate to be trite, but it's really as long as we need to. I would suspect well into fall, but I'll defer to Dr. Lacey. It, Dr. Orlando, you're exactly right. It, it's going to be as long as it takes. Um, re remember flattening the curve? Rem remember that phrase from uh, all the way back in 2020, flattening the curve? It's that intelligence that Dr. Orlando was just talking about, having a sense of what's going on the, in the community with disease transmission. That's what asymptomatic testing provides us. And so we cannot give up on collecting that, in, that, that knowledge that we're gonna need about how disease is being uh, moving through the community. And so uh, as we sit here, it's going to have to occur as long as necessary, definitely through the fall. I completely agree, Dr. Orlandi. And this is a reminder, weekly testing is available right now. It's being done at the Officers Club. It's being done at the Union Building. It's fast. It's easy. The results come back. Uh, it's, it's being done through our research enterprise. So uh, if, if anyone watching this in the campus community is not taking advantage of that, it doesn't matter if you are living on campus or working remotely, you can come in and schedule that. The easiest way to get to that is coronavirus.utah.edu, but really a, a remarkable resource that I think the university has been doing. Uh, the, next, the second biggest question I think we received in a lot of iterations is, you know, the state has announced uh, a, a, the lifting of its mask mandate on April 10th. Uh, will the university continue requiring folks, uh, people on campus to wear a mask? Dr. Good, Dr. Lacey? Sure, I'll, I'll start. Uh, yes, we're going to ask the University of Utah uh, campus community to continue to wear face coverings um, through the end of the spring semester and into uh, the summer semester as well. You know, I'm off, often asked, well, you know, I've got the vaccination. Do I still have to wear a mask? And remember, let's think through. So the vaccine creates an antibody and a cellular immunity response so that if I encounter the virus, my body has a head start on fighting that infection. It does not mean, being vaccinated does not mean that I won't encounter the virus or that I may have uh, it may be in my, my throat or, or the back of my, back of my nose. Um, I may get sick or I mildly sick or not sick at all, but it, it prevents me from getting severely ill. The vaccine prevents me, if I encounter the virus, from becoming severely ill, requiring hospitalization uh, or even worse. What we don't yet have a good handle on is if I've been vaccinated, I encounter the virus, um, I have no symptoms, but can I transmit the virus to someone who's not been vaccinated? And they then would get that quite ill. So we're going to continue with the face masks until we get a much larger uh, percentage of our population uh, vaccinated and, and with that immunity. So uh, long-winded answer, but the, the bottom line is yes, we're going to continue face coverings through the end of this semester and into the summer uh, as well. And depending on where things are in the fall, many of us anticipate we'll be, probably be wearing masks in the fall as well. But that's a decision that we can, we can make a little bit later on uh, in our planning process. Dr. Lisi? Yeah, you know, uh, all of that is exactly uh, correct. And, and I'll just answer it a slightly different way. You know, if someone asks, why is it different? Why is the, why are the county rules different than the, the university rules if, if the one is within the side, uh, inside the other? Um, and to me, that's about a, what I always think about as a standard of care, right? 
So, so we have uh, the student community uh, that we're responsible for while they're on campus. And um, we all have our, our faculty and staff teams that folks like on, on this call right now are responsible for, and, and many of you are responsible for your own team. If you work in facilities, you have your team. And I, and I think because, of, because we're the University of Utah, we have a standard of care that, that needs to be higher than, um, than, uh, than, the, than the norm or that, that could work for broader geographic areas. So to me, this is about making sure we're taking care of the students and the faculty and staff that uh, all of us feel responsible for. I was just going to jump in and add with respect to the fall and classes. Um, Dr. Good's right. I mean, we will continue to look at public health conditions. Um, but I think you should, um, to echo what uh, Dr. Lacey just said, assume we will err on the side of conservatism. Um, and uh, in terms of any decisions about the fall with respect to face coverings, right now our working assumption is, is that that would, that's how the semester would start. Uh, and just as we involved a broad-based collaborative planning team uh, to shape our instructional guidelines during COVID, uh, the uh, so-called Project Marmalade team, we will continue to engage that and other stakeholders uh, to talk through what the risk situation is um, before we made any decision about that. Um, so. Uh, in terms of what people can expect for fall class experience, expect that, uh, expect we will um, um, still have physical distancing uh, and care. So we want to err on the side of care, um, but we also want to, uh, as Dr. McDonald said, start to welcome people back um, because it is this balance of of protecting people's physical health, but recognizing that the vibrancy of the in-person experience is really a part of what, uh, as the public health conditions and vaccination rates improve, we want to embrace and support as well, because it's a big part of what the U experience really is. And, and Dr. Reed says you've got the floor. We, we'd had a question about uh, options for students. I know you, the, the, the class schedule for fall is fall semester not published. Your, your advice to a student who uh, is looking at registration but maybe is, is concerned. Uh, well, actually, that's a good way to make a point uh, as well about learning from the crisis. One of the things that was really clear that was very effective during the crisis was having our advising teams be online. That's a great example of something we will probably continue, very positive student response uh, from that. Um, so the short answer uh, is talk to your advisor about options. As I said at the outset, uh, we have a growing number of courses uh, online. Uh, and in addition, uh, connected to public health and safety, uh, it is our largest classes that uh, disproportionately will be offered online. And that's related to trying to protect health and safety. So um, uh, absolutely talk to your advisor if you have any concerns uh, about those. There, there's a wide range of online options that students can continue to take should they have concerns about public health. Yeah. And, and again, uh, if you're a pure student or a parent or advisor of a student, uh, you know, fall schedule has been posted. Uh, and, and I encourage you to go to at the U uh, to find that information. Let me turn to Jeff Herring with a lot of employee questions, uh, a lot of questions around temporary work adjustments. So Jeff, I was just gonna kind of, you know, questions about when they expire, new guidance, cutoff dates for new uh, TWAs being considered. Do you mind touching on temporary work adjustments? That's great. Now, yeah, now, now we're into the weeds on the faculty and staff here with the TWAs, but it's an important question, Chris. There are temporary work adjustments and we've had those in place. Uh, uh, during the last year uh, to help people uh, navigate through this challenging time on campus. Uh, with the prevalence of vaccinations that uh, we're starting to see and hopefully continuing on through the next few months and into summer, those temporary work adjustments will change. Uh, right now, the temporary work adjustments that are in place will be good through the end of June. But starting July 1st, we will put a new form out there with new guidance based upon what we anticipate to be there for temporary work adjustments going forward. Um, the, the, the biggest change that I think you'll see, uh, and that, that, so July 1st is when we'll start approving those for fall semester, but I wanna make sure that everyone understands 
that as we look at those going forward, it won't have the same CDC criteria after max, uh, mass vaccinations are available. We'll have the same temporary workforce adjustments, but primarily they will be granted at this point for individuals who have perhaps children at home that aren't eligible for the vaccination that have, have some concerns that way, but not just because of uh, the, the concerns that people would have in, in coming back there after they've had the chance to be vaccinated. So just want to make that point, but July 1st is the date on that, Chris. Okay. Yeah. And, and folks with very specific concerns, you can contact their HR generalist or just HR in general uh, as well. Uh, one question that came in, I know uh, the university is under a soft hiring freeze. Uh, for President Watkins, uh, Jeff Herring, uh, thoughts on you know how the university is doing uh, around that? Do we do we expect opening up some positions here shortly? I would say, of course, our first critical priority is to compensate and keep the team members that we have. With thanks to the Utah Legislature, we're going to be able to do that in the um, new fiscal year. So we're gra grateful for that, and that is priority one. I think then we begin to think about critical areas and adding people where we need them. The exception process is open and available and can be uh, pursued through your Cognizant VP as there are critical needs. And then as we go forward, taking stock of where we are and where we're growing, we can then move on to adding uh, individuals with and removing the hiring freeze entirely. I'm not certain of when that date will be that is the right time to go beyond the exception process, but I can begin to see a light at the end of the tunnel. And I turn to Jeff for any additions he wants to add. No, I think I think that's right, President Watkins. I just want to uh, reiterate, you know, that the, the faculty and staff that we have right now are the primary, we're going through a uh, concern, we're going through the budget, and I, I think that hopefully we'll come out of this uh, well. What I do want to emphasize here, maybe, Chris, is the ongoing work that we're looking at, some of the lessons learned from this and how we can work better, more efficiently. And I think that will all help as well. So, so I, I don't think we're going to, whatever the new normal is come fall, I don't think it will be the same as what it was pre-pandemic. And I think all of that will help and, and modify our hiring as well, so. Excellent, yeah, and, I, and I, for those watching, you know, it is, it's what, March 30th today, we've got a few months. Uh, and so I think some of those, we'll, we'll do deeper dives into these, some of these questions in, in the future months as well. I want to turn back to vaccinations, Dr. Orlandi specifically, and maybe Dr. Reed and Dr. McDonald, a lot of questions around vaccination mandates and maybe uh, Dr. Orlandi or, or, or Dr. Reed, you give us just an overview of, um, you know, where we're at with that and, and why, at least at this point, we, we, that would not be a mandatory requirement. Maybe I'll start out and then uh, ask President, uh, Vice President Reed to, to comment. Uh, the vaccines right now are not FDA approved in the classic way. They're, it's an emergency use authorization. It's a, a much shorter process. And because of that, um, we are, you know, I've been vaccinated, my family has, we all feel that they're safe. But um, mandating a vaccine is a little bit different right now with that approval process. And so for that reason, we're holding off on a mandate. Um, again, we'll learn more and, and, and um, we'll closely watch the FDA process. But for right now, we're very much encouraging. We think it is the best thing for all of us to uh, get vaccinated. Again, my family and I, we've all, and all my colleagues, we've all been vaccinated, um, but um, we are not mandating it right now. Uh, Vice, Senior Vice President Reed, comments? Um, no, I just echo that. And uh, SVP Good might want to comment as well on this. Um, uh, as, as Dr. Olandi said, under the uh, Emergency Youth Auth Use Authorization, so-called EUA, um, federal, by federal guidance, we, we cannot mandate uh, uh, uptake of a vaccine. There's also some state legislation uh, that defines rules. Um, there have always been exceptions for vaccinations uh, under state law. Um, the new state law that was passed in this session also includes a strongly held personal belief uh, as a qualifying uh, exemption for, uh, for COVID-19 vaccinations as well. But I just echo what Dr. Orlandi said. I'm, I'm, my second dose is tomorrow. Uh, and I'm looking forward to that. You should uh, all avail yourself of the opportunity. We believe it's safe. All the scientific evidence says it's effective, uh, but we cannot mandate it uh, given the current state uh, and, uh, and federal guidance. 
Well, I want to thank everybody. I, I think we've worked our way through most of the questions. Uh, some of the questions we haven't addressed, I, I, what I would ask our audience is we'll preserve those for future months as well. Uh, I want to let President Watkins close out, but also just emphasize, you know, a lot of, we've had a lot of questions around, you know, we are still in our spring semester guidelines. Nothing has changed currently. So all this is very, is future looking. So, you know, testing, self-reporting, following public health guidance. If it's in question, check out coronavirus.utah.edu and uh, we'll, we'll continue these conversations in the future. But with that, President Watkins will give you the last word. What a remarkable team of people uh, involved at the University of Utah campus, from University of Utah Health to all the areas represented here in this meeting. This institution has navigated well through a pandemic because of hard work, talent, advice of wise experts, and a spirit that is about supporting the health and well being of our community. Thank you all. I have uh, confidence that we have learned some things through the pandemic that will help us be a stronger and better institution going forward, from advances in how we're learning through online tools to uh, how we can help support health and safety across our institution. Thank you all for what you, do, you are doing what you have done, what you will do, and all best wishes for the future. I have to say on behalf of this team and the university, a huge thank you to our leader, President Watkins. She will be missed. We are enormously grateful for your leadership and the culture that you created that's helped us move through this crisis. So a deep and sincere thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. And uh, yeah, I have to say, preparing for a pandemic was not in the presidential playbook. Uh, and so um, I am really grateful for the, the way this campus and frankly, the state of Utah have stepped up to address some pretty significant challenges around us that we did not expect. Uh, and nevertheless, the University of Utah remains strong and has a very vibrant future. Thank you all.